The Sierra Nevada mountain range is California's watershed. It's essential in meeting the health and security needs of California's families, cities, businesses, farmers, and the environment. It's also the foundation for establishing California as the fifth largest economy in the world. It accounts for more than 25% of California's land area and forms one of the world's most important watersheds. On average, 60% of California's total annual precipitation in the form of rain and snow falls in the Sierra Nevada mountains. This snowpack can represent nearly half of California's surface water storage and is threatened by climate change. Scientists project that the snowpack will be 79% smaller by the end of the century. It is already happening. This is disrupting California's water supply, affecting agricultural food production, urban and suburban water use. We have no water and our family can't go to work. And our forest and delta ecosystems. Finding solutions is a matter of national security. The watershed, a very uh, strict definition is it, is the very highest land um, in a landscape. And that provides the dividing point in where the water goes on one side of it or the other side. Think about a watershed being a mountain range, you know, with peaks up to 14,000 feet. I mean, there's a lot of land that you capture the water from, and that's where 60% of the water that we use in California comes from, is from the watersheds in the Sierra Nevada. It's basically the, the water supply for the state of California and for most of the agriculture in the state. And the health of the forests in the Sierra Nevada are largely what determine the timing of these flows and the quality of the water and also, to some degree, the amount of water that's released into uh, the rivers and streams and ultimately into our reservoirs. So it's, it's critical for the state of California, economy, agriculture, and also the ecosystems in the state. That same watershed uh, provides, uh, you know, it's for recreation, it's an international tourist destination, it's, it's a watershed that uh, provides for significant biodiversity of species. It's hard really to explain the value of it. It is just so valuable. We're here in the Southern Sierra. Uh, we're actually in Yosemite National Park. And this is the elevation around 7,000 feet where we really start getting the snowpack. This is the snowpack that provides our water supply. The snowpack of the Sierra Nevadas are in fact our largest reservoir. And historically, our system has been designed so that when the snow falls in the Sierra Nevadas in the wintertime, it slowly melts in the spring, fills our reservoirs, and we slowly deliver that to California's ecosystems, our farms, and our cities. And it's because we've engineered the use of that water that we've been able to have a vibrant agricultural economy, vibrant cities with the industries that support those cities as well. The key to water security is to have adequate storage to capture water in the wet season to get through the dry season when we don't have rain. We're here in what's called a Mediterranean climate because it's, it's like it is in the Mediterranean where you have a wet, a wet winters and dry summers. And in order to do the, uh, the irrigation during the summer, we need to store water from the winter behind dams in groundwater and the snowpack is an important part of that winter storage. And as the population has grown and demands have increased for clean water and food, managing the structures that we inherited has become a real challenge. The way we've organized our water system is we assume that every winter 
we're gonna get a snowpack. And we have an average size that we expect. But those were the old days. Now we're, we're warming it up and we're making that rain and snow less reliable, right? So you can't count on it every year at the same time and the same amounts. A tremendous number of our storms come in within a couple degrees of freezing. So if we have warming temperatures, we have more of that precipitation coming down as rain than snow. With a warmer climate, these big snowstorms are all of a sudden sometimes rainstorms, which our reservoirs uh, are not equipped to handle or pass through. These intense storms can quickly fill our Sierra Nevada reservoirs. We need to release water so that the, the dams aren't over, over top by the water. When we release that water, that can potentially cause flooding. On top of that, we, we go very boomer bust. We have drought cycles that are extremely dry. And then we have wet years that are really huge, you know, flooding type years. So our snowpacks are getting smaller. And by the end of the century, um, we're predicting that snowpacks will be about 80% smaller. That means a lot less water is being stored up in the mountains. Absent that water, you don't have Southern California that we know today. We don't have this economy. California is not the world leader in the Silicon Valley. It's not the leader of the entertainment industry. We don't have the best farming in the world. We don't have any of those without healthy water supplies. There is no new normal for climate change because it's going to continue for the rest of our lives. No one alive today will ever see a stable climate system again. The climate system will always be changing, and that means the kind of landscape that we can see around us, the kind of plants growing in our forests, the kind of crops that we can grow in our agricultural lands at lower elevations, are all going to be changing for our entire lives. It is a matter of national security because California provides so much of the nation's food supply. California produces more than half of some of the fruits, nuts, or vegetables that are consumed in the United States. The food that's produced in the San Joaquin Valley is consumed all across the country. So this isn't a California-centric issue. This issue is in the best interest of all Americans. It's worked well, except that the whole system's changing. And if we don't change with a system, then we aren't looking the future in the face. The loss of that snowpack and the changing of that, uh, the pattern by which we receive the precipitation, more as rain than snow, is of great concern to us. We simply don't have the, the uh, human engineered system to be able to make up for that. And a way that we can leverage our new system or make our new system work is to actually think of how can we take the water that we can't keep behind our reservoir and put it back in the ground. And this ground that I'm talking about is particularly the Central Valley. So it's available that we can use it when we have periods um, of drought or dry weather, or we've had a very small snowpack. We've actually stored water, um, so we have it available. So as we update our dams and spillways for uh, handling flooding in a warming climate, as we uh, update some of our uh, groundwater recharge facilities for handling some of the storage that we don't have as we have more rain and, and less snow, let's make sure we put those investments into our natural infrastructure, into our, into our headwaters. To maintain those healthy supplies of water, we need to maintain those watersheds. Those watersheds are where the water comes from. You have to protect the water at its source. If we look at California history, California was settled relatively late compared to a number of the other states. California was not really settled until the gold rush. And then we had massive amounts of people coming in and they immediately went to the Sierra Nevada and they put these mines in. And the one thing that they really wanted was to prevent forest fires. Fire is a part of the natural ecosystem. It's a way of clearing out the scrub brush and, and the dead wood and, and all that fuel buildup. 
Because of this history of fire suppression, we now have forests that are overgrown and that are prone to fires. The forest of the early 1900s shows that it was a smaller number of trees than we have now, maybe only 20% the number of trees, and there were big trees. If you go there now, it's just dense. There's still a few large trees, but there's a lot of small trees out there. Every tree that's alive needs water. So the more trees that you have in the forest, the more water the forest needs. We've, we've just gone through a decade of drought in California. That decade of drought in California killed millions of trees that are still out there that need to be cleared. And now on top of it, climate change with hotter temperatures starting early in the year, drier weather, those things are a recipe for disaster. Climate change is shifting the ground under our feet. It's changing what the world around us can look like. And one of the ways that we get there to that future of tomorrow with a changed climate that's still changing, right, is fire. We're getting fires of such intensity that we haven't seen before. I just consider it like hell's exhaust pipe from the forestry to the atmosphere in the worst possible way when these wildfires happen. The air quality standards, the particle emissions, the soot that gets formed, the loss of life, the loss of property, and then the time to recover, uh, I think it, it's something that we shouldn't, if at all possible, allow to happen just through negligence or oversight. When you go 30, 40, 50 years without fire, when you have one, they're catastrophic because there's the fuel buildup's been so huge. So those policies weren't well thought through at the turn of the century when we developed them. The fire suppression regime that we've had for more than a century has greatly impacted our natural infrastructure. It's, it's degraded its ability to store and filter water in, in ways that continue to be, frankly, a crisis for us. That unanticipated consequence of very good intentions has now created what our counties believe will be decades of trying to manage our way out of a very volatile situation where the forests are ready to burn up, essentially, without a lot of instigation. They're so fragile right now. We've created a perfect storm, and we're watching it as we see the fires occur throughout the Sierra Nevada. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Two deadly wildfires continue to burn in California where thousands of firefighters are working to save homes and lives. The fire in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains north of Sacramento has burned 109,000 acres and is 25% contained. Camp Wildfire roared through Paradise, California last November, leaving 85 people known dead and the town a wasteland. Paradise is a, a, a small community. It's a place that you want your children to grow up. It's kind of a, a golden spot in California. It really, it really was a, a paradise. I grew up in paradise and I remember my parents telling me, you know, our biggest danger here is fire. You know, we live on a ridge between two canyons, and a big fire at some point is going to burn through this town. <laughs> Heavenly Father, please help us. Please help us to be safe. I'm thankful for hearing You know, hearing that, and then all of a sudden it's there. And yes, this is the big one. This is what happens, um, completely derails the rest of your life and all the things you think you did right in choosing a place to live and a place to raise your family and building a home. And, and then it just didn't exist after that or was everything was different. Here's our place. 
the letters are still on. There's, There's just different different layers of, of sadness. The one that's been the most difficult, I think, so far has been the human factor in it and the people who were so much a part of our lives on November 7th, you know, going to soccer games and best friends in class and your colleagues and your neighbors. And then all of a sudden they're, they're gone. They moved, you don't know where they are. I don't know where our, our male person is. You know, I didn't have a grand relationship with our male person, but it was somebody I saw almost every day. Um, the, the, the human factor is, is pretty powerful. I was a, a firefighter for 33 years. Uh, there's no question uh, these devastating fires, uh, it hurts the environment, losing people's homes and lives. It's, it's terrible. It's probably just a matter of time before something like this happens again, probably in paradise. Plan for it. We have to get ahead of it. We have to really start working aggressively on keeping these fires not only at a smaller level, but also just clearing, clearing the fuel load. Going forward in time, either wildfire is going to clear our forest or we can manage our forest in a sustainable way. Active land management is such a critical, vital role in sustaining those ecosystems that uh, without it, it really presents a, we'll call it a clear and present danger to the continued existence and benefit of those ecosystems to the region, both in terms of its human occupants and in just terms of natural ecosystem development and stability. We can do that by selectively thinning parts of the forest to create fire breaks where the fire will go on the ground and not up in the canopy. We can, uh, we can use mechanical thinning for that. We can also use a managed wildfire where you have people out on the ground uh, selectively burning parts of the forest. So by picking those areas strategically, then when a larger wildfire comes, it's contained and it's managed. We can use science to come up with the forest management practices with the thinning patterns that will give us a healthy habitat in the forests will give us a forest that's good for recreation as well as wildlife, a forest that can produce uh, timber or biofuels as well as water. Now, if we had them thinned out uh, and spaced out, you would generate 10%, 12, 15% more water deliveries on average. That's a heck of a lot of water. There are multiple opportunities for creative solutions for public-private partnerships as we thin the forest to use that biomass as a resource for, for energy and for other, other products that can benefit society. The biomass sector in general is a great way to really revitalize rural economic districts and develop these technologies that are to the benefit of the local economy and the state and national economies. Repairing our infrastructure, maintaining our infrastructure, to bringing on renewable energy, to transforming our economy from one based on fossil fuels to one based on renewable energy, that has the potential for being the biggest job growth of the next couple of decades. This project could increase recreational opportunities, fix up forest roads, better maintain and construct trails for, you know, for hiking, restore streams, build new campgrounds. There, there are uh, lots of things that would be a benefit to the public and to the wildlife resource and the forest itself. We've done studies and we've shown that, uh, you know, the, the major benefits of uh, forest uh, health improvements, forest restoration work really accrue to landowners and you've seen that in recent fires. I mean, who's most impacted by the fire is the you know, forest service, it's the people that live uh, in, the, in the forest or on private holdings within the forest. The majority of the Sierra Nevada is, is under, under control of federal agencies. The U.S. Forest Service, the U.S. Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, those are the main land managers. The U.S. Forest Service manages 
20 million out of California's 100 million acres. That's over, that's 20% of the state. Of those 20 million acres, they've estimated that 8 million acres are in immediate need of restoration. That is, they're so overgrown, they're at high risk of high intensity wildfire if they haven't burned already. So they need, they need some form of restoration. I believe we're at a point where we're finally, uh, at a scale we've never seen before, coming together around this issue to try to actually increase the, the work on the ground to, to realize restoration work at a pace and scale that is, that is of the, the magnitude that we have to achieve across the landscape, across all watersheds throughout the state, uh, to really try to, to change the, the course that we're on as much as we possibly can. The ecosystem and the ecology is all integrated. And you can't just take one part of that system and try to bring it to health and, and expect other parts to respond appropriately. We're finding everything is integrated. So I think we're at a, an important moment in human history in California where we start looking in a way that really connects all the pieces and gets all the decision makers hopefully working together with the same information so that we can make the best decisions possible for the state when it comes to water. We're looking at some, some pretty large costs to restore our forests to a, a sustainable state, uh, several, several billion dollars. Instead of looking to Congress uh, for too much additional funds, we're looking to the people in California who benefit from forest restoration. We're building public-private partnerships with hydropower agencies, with uh, water providers who really benefit from having lower wildfire risk, and they get more water. And that's where the Yuba Water Agency has been very proactive in putting this type of environment on our plate and taking the responsibility that we need to pay close attention to that. Yuba County Water has agreed to finance forest restoration on a prototype project of uh, several thousand acres. And if that works out, they say they're committed to expanding that to much larger areas. It's an experiment in our watershed. It's what's going to be most advantageous to our communities and our water. It's a model that we would like to put together for the rest of the state. And we're testing it here to see how effective it's going to be. This is a public-private partnership where the private parties are handling the financing and the thinning. And the public agencies, the Forest Service is the landowner. They're providing the oversight. The other public agency is Yuba County. They agreed to pay off the bonds. And we at, uh, at the University of California are also partners in these projects. So we're providing some of the technical tools to verify the benefits. This model, as you indicated earlier, can be used throughout not only the state of California, but hopefully throughout the nation. And it all starts with one small project, one small idea that builds out, that affects so many people and our environment. Some local agencies may have the money up front to put into a forest thinning project or they may able, be able to get grants, but in many other areas that's going to be limited. So having this bond financing to spread the project costs over 15, 20 or, or longer uh, number of years is, is uh, I think, a good solution. In this case, I see nothing but winners and that's the track we need to run on. Uh, this glass is half full and I'd like to continue seeing it fill. It, it is extremely valued that we work together to resolve these issues. We have the resources, we have the, the ingenuity and the innovation to make this happen. And, and I think that's why we're seeing some things emerge on, the, in, on a landscape scale within certain watersheds that are extremely promising. And we just need to build upon that and, and grow those uh, across all areas of the state where, where this is a, is a continuing threat. For the rest of our lives, the climate system is going to be changing. But the degree to which it changes is still up to us. We could have a, still have a very positive, bright future, but only if we make it so. I want my generation to leave 
to the next generation the same water security and the same opportunity that, that I have. The kids that are here alive today are gonna have to live with all of these consequences. And the ones that are old enough to have a voice need to speak up. You know, the, this next generation coming up and you wanna not only protect the planet for them, but then you see how you can also educate the next generation of, of where our planet is currently standing. Everything that they experience for the rest of their lives is basically gonna be determined by the choices we make over the next 10 years. Inaction is not an option. You have to take a positive step to have a future worth preserving. All of us together.